What's up everybody out there? I just want to welcome you again to another episode of Brownstone Radio. This week I'm proud to bring to you one of the, the up and coming minds, one of the up and coming voices of our generation. Uh, you might have seen this man on YouTube, you might have seen him uh, interviewing some of your favorite celebrities, some of your favorite uh, hip hop artists, uh, in particular Dame Dash, uh, the one, the only Kenyatta the Barber. Had a great time interviewing Kenyatta. Just want to bring to everybody his story, his vision, his uh, his drive uh, to not only promote black entrepreneurship, but just to promote thought amongst our youth. Take a listen. You know, as always, let us know what you think. And uh, check out Kenyatta's website, too. Here we go. Um, I kind of want to touch bases with you on a couple different things. I hope, hopefully, I won't take a lot of your time. Um, I guess, kind of, where did you grow up? How did you grow into the person you are now? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I'm originally from uh, Los Angeles, California. Okay. Uh, I grew up in uh, uh, Tennessee, Jackson, Tennessee. I was okay. for a couple years in junior high school, and then we moved to North Carolina, uh, the Gastonia, Charlotte, Kings Mountain. Mm-hmm. area in uh i mean in uh, north carolina and then mm-hmm. i moved back to la and once i graduated from high school uh i became a barber by trade i went to beauty college to learn how to cut women's hair mm-hmm. uh but what i did was i stuck with barbering it just added a, you know it's just actually enhanced and advanced my, my cutting skills going to beauty college so i stuck with barbering and then uh when i was about like 22 I had bought the shop that I was working in, and then um, I only ran that shop for a good uh, over 15 years on Crenshaw Boulevard in Los Angeles. And in the process of, you know, the whole time, you know, being an entre- independent entrepreneur, I studied a lot. Like, I, I'm a big fan of the uh, self-help genre of books, mm-hmm. and audio books. And, uh, you know, some of my favorites, of, you know, like, one of my favorites, 48 Laws of Power. I think that's a lot of people's favorites. Um, I like stuff by Neville. I like uh, Napoleon Hill's books. I like uh, Motivation as far as Les Brown, a good friend of mine as well. Um, you know, I've just been always been into spirituality. And then on top of that, I've also studied, you know, I've always had knowledge of self, studied the Father's Sin teachings when I was younger. And then I mm-hmm. studied... Um, a lot of autobiographies, like one of my favorites is the autobiography of Malcolm X. And then from there, you know, I studied African culture on a whole, you know, on every level, you know. Um, and then I've always been a big fan of hip hop. So what I decided to do was mix the culture of hip hop with motivation and then, you know, bring it to the culture of hip hop in a way that we understand and we don't feel as corny. Because I felt like a lot of stuff that I was listening to by Napoleon Hill and uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer and all these guys, you know, no offense to them. But, you know, when I, if I played that around my homeboys, they would be like, yo, turn that off. That's that's whack. You know what I'm saying? Because some old <laughs> white man talking to us, opposed to someone right, that understands right. the slang and, you know, how to deliver a message that really reaches the hip-hop culture. So that's where mm-hmm. I come in. So what I did was, I prepared and started writing a book called Thinking Ball Out. And on the day I started preparing the book Thinking Ball Out, as well as coming up with the idea to start the company Hip Hop Motivation, I was shot six times um, on my way to my house to get my laptop. Uh, from there, I was going to Cut Method Man, but obviously I didn't make it to Cut Method Man. So yeah, I was in critical condition. Um, I went through a process where, you know, I was harassed by the cops while I was laying there bleeding, mm-hmm. coughing up blood, you know, then, you know, kind of asking me where, you know, who I am and what did I do to deserve this, you know, and in that position, I don't think that's uh, a question that anyone should ask. Yeah, you know what I'm you know, saying? So, you know, that wasn't even my focus to, to go through that. But at that time, right. you know, obviously, you know, I never, I never gang banged, I never you know, sold drugs, any of that stuff, I always cut hair. And, um, you know, 
and I know that, you know, being a black man sometimes is period, you know, violence and different things sometimes find us in different situations. Right. But at that time, the place where I was living at, I was like really satisfied with where I was living. And then on top of that, I was just coming to the realization that consciousness is, is God. And each one of us possess consciousness enough to change whatever situation we're dealing with or whatever our living arrangement is or whatever our pockets look like, um, you know, and that, you know, we are the I am. And whatever you add to the back of I am, you become. And so in this state, laying on the ground bleeding, is where I felt like the separation from spirit and flesh. Mm -hmm. um, then I realized that well, as I was laying there on the ground, everything around me was the same as me. It was, it was, it was like one, it was a oneness. It was a peaceful feeling. And in the hospital, once I came to, took a few days or whatever, I came to, and I started writing, finishing up, thinking ball out. And, uh, I came out of the hospital with a, uh, desire to bring forth to the culture, hip hop motivation. And, uh, you know, at that time I didn't have a testimony before getting shot, you know, so not a testimony as far as, something heinous is that happening to me. I, I didn't even have, you know, I've never really went through too much, too many terrible things. I didn't really have any losses other than my father passing mm -hmm. when I was like 18. But, you know, he was, you know, he was older. So, you know, that's kind of like, you know, everybody, that's, everybody's going to see that day. But, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't have a testimony before that. Not in that way. Um, and I just moved forward with hip-hop motivation, man. And, uh, my whole objective was to bring forth self-help materials from a hip-hop perspective to a culture that needs it, I feel like, more than any other culture. You know what I'm saying? Because there's a lot of things that mislead you in the thinking a certain way and the praising and looking for things outside of yourself and still looking within. And, you know, but, you know, it's nothing, nothing against hip-hop in general, rap music. It's just, you know, I feel like we kind of like a janitorial service, you know, cleaning up some of the corners that have been left a little dirty in the culture. That's it, you know, and that's where we are right now. That's why I put up the videos with Dane, because Dane wasn't really, that wasn't really what he wanted to do, you know. So mm -hmm. when I would go by and cut his hair, I just kept recording, recording, recording. And, you know, he has a bald head, so he's getting cut sometimes twice a week. <clears throat> so I would go through there. Uh, and uh, after I would cut his hair, I would film him or record him uh, in an interview style. And he didn't even know I was putting the videos up at first. <laughs> and then I told him, and I told him the type of reaction, and he started getting, like, media coverage, you know, a lot of press, a lot of different things, because things were outspoken. And, uh, you know, next thing I know, Hip Hop Motivation is blowing up on the scene, and then Dame Dash is reemerging into pop culture again through these interviews in a positive way. And, right, uh, right. And I, I will say that um, it did actually change my opinion of them. You know, as people who sit at home and, and we're consumers of yeah. information, entertainment, right. we tend to make these snap judgments and hold on to them for years as to who someone is when we don't know them. And I felt kind of like that was the first time I'd ever had the opportunity to hear Dame talk about himself and his philosophies and his business moves in a, in a fashion that wasn't shaped by someone else. Yeah, yeah, then, you know, like like I said, Dame, Dame is an interesting guy, you know, like, mm -hmm. as heavy as he is on business, as heavy as I am in spirituality and consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I felt like it was like a perfect, perfect relationship, um, mm -hmm. you know, between homeboys where we can bring forth something good for the culture. And then once he did right. find out what we were doing, he was actually pleased with the response because, you know, he'd be in the streets and people would walk up to him and like, you know, thank you. And, you know, come up to him like, man, you know, you know, I really appreciate the videos and this and that. He's like, you know, he would call me and tell me. And I already knew that was going to happen because that was happening mm -hmm. to me when I would go through and talk to Dane years back without recording mm -hmm. him. And I would always lead with something. Because he's one of those guys, he's just an out of the box thinker. You know, he, mm -hmm. he is he is one of our great minds in the culture of mm -hmm. hip hop. And as far as African American people, he's one of our great minds. And mm -hmm. I just thought that it had been, you know, I couldn't miss the opportunity with bringing it to the culture and 
just to the public, man, and just giving it away for free because we didn't monetize the videos either. Because my whole objective, even still, was not just, oh, let's, let's make money off of the, the lack of knowledge people have. You know, and, mm. and that's not what I was thinking. I was thinking more of let's enhance our people and then bring them into right. whatever hip hop motivation is offering after that. Because then they, I felt like a lot of people would be ready for what we're offering. You know, which is self help materials from a hip hop perspective. Right. Yeah. I want to backtrack just a little bit um, to kind of the first business, the barbershop. What led you? Was there there's something that something was instilled in you that said to yourself, entrepreneurship is the way to go? Because, you know, as I've said before, we, we're not raised in a fashion to want to go out and be our own bosses. We're more raised to be workers. Yeah, definitely. Well, being a barber, you know, for the, mm-hmm. many for many years, and like before I actually got the shop for years before that, mm-hmm. you know, I recognize that, you know, I mean, we all have a boss. You know, mm-hmm. even if you're independent, you know, the customer the customer becomes the boss. But the right. thing, the difference is you get to call your shots, you get to uh, set your time, set your price, and do different things like that, and you can travel and go wherever it is you want to go. But at the same mm-hmm. time, you know, for me, I just never was really into someone telling me what to do on a day-to-day basis because while I was on a beauty college, I worked for UPS. And at UPS, you know, it, it kind of disgusted me working for UPS to to a point where, you know, that just let me to know and believe that the job is not for me. That was where I really got to understand that the job that the job market was not for me, you know, and because I noticed that the people that work for that company at the time, everybody's trying to outdo each other. Everybody's trying to set people up and. You know, you had people putting, you know, if I had a, say, Louisiana truck, right? They was putting, like, a Boston box in my truck that I was loading up <laughs> trying to, you know what I'm saying, get me fired. And, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of politics, you know what I'm saying? And, and then I, did, I just never understood how somebody could lay their life on the line and, and, and protect something that's not there so much to the point where they're brainwashed. It's almost like when you go to McDonald's or you go to any fast food restaurant, and you asking for extra ketchup, and the person is tripping like, you know what I'm saying? Like, damn, they want to charge you for each meal. You're like, yo, man, just give me a key. They put that in the bag. Like, what are you, why are you protecting this? Like, what is this? Like, this is a multi-billion dollar company. Come on, man. You know what I'm saying? So I just never understood it, man. I never wanted to understand it. So I just stayed independent. And I found that there's a, there's a, there's a definite blessing in being independent, which is you're able to move around and actually pick up some different things when you're independent. You know, you don't have to be stuck in one lane. You can do some different things. And that's why, you know, hip-hop motivation was appropriate on top of being a barber because, you know, in the black community, as all communities, the barber is the guy that, you know, everybody kind of consoles in and talks to and we're able to do our own census and we come in contact with so many people from all walks of life, you know, and this is my story. I've, I've you know, so many I've cussed me, entertainers and pimps, Hustlers, doctors, lawyers, judges, and this is my clientele still to this day. You know, so I have people from all walks of life, and I, I found out one thing is for sure is that the people that have goals have a different disposition than the people that don't have goals. You know, I found that out doing my own senses in the shop. You know, the people that don't have goals actually walk through life unenthusiastic, you know, with no enthusiasm, you know, and they're looking for a weekend where the people with goals seem to have a more pleasant disposition. And these, some of these people with pimps, hustlers, and, you know, you know, some, sometimes people that are in the, in the gang world, but they just have a goal to become an artist. And they just get pleasure out of playing their music or recording. And uh, it's a definite, definite difference. And I picked up on that before I started Hip Hop Motivation. So, I felt like I just needed to bring people up to that level to where they're inspired by having their own thing that they're working towards as opposed to working for someone else and building their company up or someone else's business up. So that's where the independence came from. What is it that keeps black people from being able to move forward into the path of entrepreneurship? Well, the first the first thing is, you know, like, you know, it's, it's interesting you asked that question because last night, 
uh, I, I watched or oh, purchased um, 7 a.m. It's a new movie that came out uh, with Dr. Claude Anderson, uh, Omar, uh, Dr. Umar, and uh, a couple other people that I've never even seen before. But the movie was great. I loved it. You know, but we were talking about some of the people, some of the guys in the shop were talking about how what they were saying is great and all, but, you know, people have to be re-raised into that type of thinking because you got to remember, our our ancestors and our people, we didn't really pass down business ethics to each other. We didn't pass down entrepreneurship to each other. So it's just like if you have a child and you tell the child at 13 years old, he's on his own. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what most black people are. We're like that child in the world and we don't know what to do. Only thing we know how to do is to work. And a 13 year old is going to know that, okay, well, to eat, I have to get some money. I mean, it's common sense. But if you don't right. understand and don't know that, you know, there's certain investments, you know, ask what assets are and what liabilities are, you don't need, you know, our people, a lot of our people don't understand the meanings of these words, you know, so it has to start back down to the ground, the grassroots of business. We have to actually start at the grassroots of business and learn the, the definition behind these words I and mean, what these words mean. And that's why, like, we create the secret to balling and uh, really more than anything else to teach people to look forth, look forth towards the inner faculties of themselves, you know, the inner network, you know, learn about research, planning, how, how important planning is. You know, these things might sound like, oh, well, that's just easy, that's common sense, but... I mean, shit, man, it doesn't look like it's too much common sense for a lot of our people because 85%, we out here like dumb, deaf, and blind. We don't have no knowledge of of what's going on business-wise or with ourselves, you know? Right. So it's like we have to, we have to, we have to study. We have to get knowledge, man, to, and, and do a lot of research, man, to build ourselves up and our people, you know, because it's easy to come out there, oh, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, but it's, you have to, you have to, you know, you can't, you don't, you don't start school in sixth grade. You have to go through preschool, pre-K, kindergarten. So there's levels to the game. There's levels to the game, man. And we got to start off at the, the grassroots and bring people up, man. Not criticize, but bring people up, man. That's it. Right. Especially for African Americans, for us. Man, we, it's a job that has to be done continually. And then we have to pay attention to the people that have, the haves. You know, a lot of people, you know, they, you know, it's white privilege jumping off out here in the world. You know, you got people that, you know, are still living off the sweat, blood, sweat, and tears of our ancestors. I mean, shoot, all of them, really. So, you know, you have to look at that. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sad, it's sad, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's not, it's not even, it's, it's not even a thing where we should be looking for sympathy. We should be looking for empathy. You know, if somebody's giving us the knowledge and information to help us move forward, and I'm glad to see like a movie like Seven A, and I'm glad to see like Hidden Colors brand, and you know all these great people putting together movies, you know, just to help our people. And that's why Hidden, that's why Secret of Balling is, you know, extraordinary because I took entertainers and made them motivational speakers, you know, and get a little game from them. I was looking at my Facebook and. You know, as everyone knows, your Facebook is a timeline of just everyone's random thoughts, whether they're politically correct or not. And um, a person who I, I have great respect for uh, posted Ben Carson's comments from the uh, the debate the other day. And he said something that I found just to be so naive in the context that he said, um, when I operate on someone, I don't care about the color of their skin because I'm looking at the inside, at their brain, and that's all that matters. And I just found it to be such a naive statement because it's, you know, I think it's important that we do recognize that there is such a thing as white entitlement. Oh, okay. It has nothing to, you know, it has nothing to do with with racism. Right. It's a matter of fact. Right. And I feel like a lot of um, black people tend to use the word racism as its umbrella when that's not what they mean. Right, really race, and what, and they don't right understand what race is. Like, race doesn't have right. anything to do with color. It has everything to do with economics. And right. and, and that's why, you know, like you're saying, it's my privilege, but there's something that's stronger than all that, and that's when you become conscious. See, you have mm-hmm. to go within yourself to 
find yourself, and then you start uplifting your people because consciousness is God, you know, and that white privilege is not more privileged than God. So we have to begin to look within ourselves and raise ourselves up and just, you know, become better people, man. Just understand and recognize there's no God without yourself, outside of yourself. You know, the true, true living is right right with you at all times. You know what I'm saying? And, and if we don't understand that that principle and that philosophy, we get to praising people and looking for people to take care of us outside of ourselves. And the true living is being with you at all times anyway. You know, so why should I really look for someone else to uplift me when I can start with myself? But at the same time, that upliftment is good until you can believe in yourself, if possible. You know, I'm, all, I'm a firm believer in, you know, sometimes you have to believe in someone else's belief in you until you believe it's yourself. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all polarity, man. It's, it's just, you know, there's no absolute wrong and there's no absolute right. It just is, man. It's just God. That's it. You know? I think one of the most powerful things that there is is someone's belief in you because that can actually move you to the next level. You know? Yeah, definitely. I may not think I can reach that rung, but yeah. you're telling me I can reach it. And you're, you're so behind me that I have to reach out to it just because I don't want to disappoint this faith that you have in me. And that faith becomes my faith. Exactly. It's, it's just transmuting, man. And, and that's why, that's what I'm saying. Like, it just takes individuals to become conscious and then help other people become conscious. See, it's like we all, we all are connected. We're all in the same spiritual bloodline. So there's no separation. But at the same time, you know, people are separated by their character. You know, they're separated by so-called by the things they do but at the same thing at the same time it's all god it's all god there's, there's no difference it's all god you know because you couldn't move your finger you couldn't move your mouth it's nothing in existence that exists without god so even that so-called white privilege is something that is you know real on the physical plane but on the spiritual plane i mean my god is more powerful than all that you know, the recognition of myself is more powerful than all that, you know. And I understand on the physical plane, that's, you know, what we rely on. That's what, how we make our moves and do what we have to do. But at the same time, this is just a meat suit. You're here for a purpose, and when that purpose is done, you leave, and the only thing you take with you is consciousness. Mm-hmm. And that's circulated back into another meat suit. So it's, 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 this is, you know, we hold on to something that, you know what I'm saying? We try to hold on to these things and the stuff we have, but at the same time, man, it's hey man, it's it's it's, it's all circulation. It's just like breathing in, breathing out. You come in, come in this world, you go out this world. You come in this world, you go out this world. You don't spend money, you circulate money. When you spend it doesn't come back. So you have this you know, you have to understand what you're saying, you have to understand the power of the word and more than anything else, the power of the mind. You know. So, what's next? What, where well, what's do you see next? yourself in the next five years? Well, in the next five years, like right now, um, I have right now we have six projects that are finished and they're ready to come out. So, you know, we already kind of steps ahead of the game because you know I've been working on this hip hop motivation thing for the last ten years, and uh, without any recognition, without anybody seeing anything just going out speaking at schools and different places here and there, taking Toastmasters, building myself up, a lot of studying. And, uh, you know, we got Culture Votes is the book coming. You know, that's a business okay. manual that uh, where, you know, over the 10 years, I studied Dane. You know, it's a 10-year book, basically. And I took the best parts and put it together and compiled it to make Culture Votes. We have Think and Ball Out, the book. The audio book is up right now on Bandcamp, iTunes, Amazon, uh, and Google Play and a few other places. And uh, that's the audio book that, the, that's the book I wrote the day I got shot. But we're re-releasing that on a massive level, and uh, we're going to film that next as well. We have The Secret of the Balling coming. Uh, the Secret of the Balling is finished. We're looking for a distribution. We're looking for a, uh, a streaming situation for ourselves right now, myself and the team. And uh, gotcha. we have a lot of people on the on the table right now, so it's kind of like we're just looking for the best situation and how we can get it out to the people. Not so much exactly. the money, but how yeah, it could be marketed to where people know what's up. You know, we don't want to just put a movie out like this type of movie. You don't just throw out. This is not a 
you know, this is not a movie where it's, it's just camcorder style. We just filmed it on the on the whim. You know, you have these top entertainers in a movie like this. You have to treat it with gentle, loving care, a little bit more. You know what I'm saying? To me, a little different than you would just throwing something out because you have people's brands in your movie. And so I can't I can't compromise their brands because they trust me enough to let, allow me to use their brands to bring forth this information. So I can't compromise them. So that's why I haven't just thrown it out. It's been finished. Um, but we feel like we want to put a little marketing, a little something behind it to get it just all over the world and for people where they can stream it and rent it, buy it, whatever they want to do with it. So then, you taught yourself the, the movie game or... Well, with the movie, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, basically it was trial and error. We just, I mean, I've always been a writer, so, mm -hmm. you know, I just looked at the math of it and, you know, got got with my uh, friend of mine that I've known for many years since I was about eight years old, Jonathan Lindsay, who was a director of The Secret to Ballin, and uh, mm -hmm. he went to film school. He actually teaches at uh, Dominguez College out here in L.A., uh, the film department. And uh, we got together and uh, just put a movie together, man. And then Carolyn Gentle, she she was also that's my that's my partner. Uh, and her sister Michelle Gentle was actually my lady. She we put it together, man, and we just went in and just put the movie, you know, just created a, a dynamic project, man. But I didn't know anything about the film game myself. Uh, this is my first time doing anything in the film industry or you know anything like this. But Carolyn and Sean knew a lot about how to film and what it takes and storyboards you know I didn't know anything about any of that she you know what I'm saying I didn't know that every movie has a storyboard I didn't know that you have to set up shot dates and you know it's a lot it was it's a lot to it but it was a wonderful learning process man turned into different people filming this movie was super involved, man. like we turned into like each and each and every one of us man it's just something about when you start something and you finish you know and I'm sure y'all can agree with that because Right, just like right. the blogs, like, you know, once upon a time, it was just an idea. And then this idea became reality. And it's just no better feeling than having something that you created, growing and thriving. And, you know, people beginning to recognize who you are and what you're doing. You know, nothing like it. <laughs> you know, so there's no feeling. Like, you're talking about sex, drugs, or whatever, alcohol. <laughs> Man, ain't nothing like accomplishing a goal, brother. You're talking about a high. Well, whew. You talking about man? That's the highest you could ever be when you when you set out to do something and you actually accomplish it. There's no high like that. There's no high like it. And I'm willing and I'm willing to debate anybody that there's a high like that. <laughs> that there's any high that's there that accomplish with a goal you set out to. You know anything you set out to do. You know, you're trying to lose weight. You're trying to gain weight. You're trying to get muscles. You're trying to get some money. You're trying to move. Whatever. Whatever the goal is, man, it's like there's no high like that. And then you, you know, does it give me the same feel as uh, writing does? Yeah, definitely, man. Like when I write, you know, when I finish projects or even chapters, it's just like, man, I be buzzing, man. I be like, man, I have a lot of energy, and I have to sometimes channel that energy energy in different ways, like by going to the gym, taking a walk, or hanging out with my girl, or you know. Uh, playing with my kids, <laughs> you know, so it's like, it's yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a lot of energy that takes place when you accomplish something because you gotta remember you're channeling God. So all creation is God. There's nothing you don't create nothing yourself. You didn't create, you know, brownstone media like that's God just using you and whoever else to bring it forth. It's an idea. Ideas are God. Imagination is God. Consciousness is God. This is a mental universal. So everything is God in existence. You know, when you understand that philosophy, you begin to not give too much credit to white supremacy, Mexican supremacy, black supremacy. You become, you become to understand that at the same time, whatever your mind tells you it is, it is. So be it. That's why you have to be careful and understand the I am. Whatever you ask the I am, you become. Period. Um,